Greetings ladies and gentlemen and welcome to the uh, next Transforming Assessment eAssessment Scotland online conference session. Uh, today is 16th of September, so we're in the week, second week of the conference. Um, today's session is by Seb Sebastian and Philippe. They are both from the University of Bern, the Institute for Medical Education in um, wonderful Switzerland. <clears throat> They're going to be talking about their uh, EOSCI system, so electronic um, uh, OSCI uh, marking um, software that they've they've created. So, Philippe um, and Sebastian, would you like to uh, please take over now? Thank you, Matthew, um, and hi to everyone from Switzerland. <coughs> we are on our side. It's uh, as Matthew said, it's Sebastian and me that's going to be talking today. I don't know if you have video on your side, um, but yeah, we're going to talk about the development and the functionality of the EOSCI system. I'm not sure if any one of you has been using the, the, the system already. Can you indicate with the, the tick mark if you have been using or if you have heard of it or if you actually used it yourself? Okay, so quite new to everyone. Well, then it's going to be hopefully the more interesting um, if you haven't seen or used it before. Um, some words about the agenda today. We're going to tell you why we developed the, the system and introduced the process um, of using eOSCI shortly and make a demonstration with a, a few uh, screenshots and then we're going to tell you how we developed the, the whole system. It was not quite a straightforward process to be honest with you. Um, it took uh, quite some turns, uh, unexpected turns to develop it. We had a, a very strong user-centered uh, development focus while developing it and so it was not uh, from the beginning on clear in which direction it would develop. Um, but to start right up with the motivation, I mean we came across the OSCE um, exams or, or OSCE process uh, as um, viewers not really as involved people. My institute, the Institute of Medical Education, does OSCEs not just for our faculty or the University of Bern, but for all of Switzerland for the final exams of the of the medical students. And watching and and watching the 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 people responsible for for the exams um, kind of stung in in the in the heart because we've seen how they had to uh, handle all these paper checklists prepare them and especially um, going after the examiners during the exam telling them to please check uh, again that they missed some some markings that they had to scan these uh, paper checklists and this took quite a while these time averages here on the on the on the figure are not for a normal OSCE I mean it, it didn't take 26 days for a normal OSCE and then 12 days af afterwards this is really for the national exams for the final exams in, in Switzerland so our main focus was to remove these uh, uh, media breaks of having to print out paper checklists and scan the checklists back in. Why is this so important? The main thing why this is problematic is that the data quality of these paper checklists is very poor. There were a lot of missing ratings on the checklists which had to be replaced by a, a guess uh, or, or by a missing value. These corrections were already during the exams quite costly because there was a lot of personnel 
running after the examiners and telling them to please fill everything out that they missed. Also, there were a lot of errors uh, detected during scanning and these errors had to be corrected in a, in a uh, very long process. The whole evaluation took very long because the, the printing out, preparing Uh, Sebastian, can you hear me? And printing out and scanning the checklists um, took uh, too long, actually. Um, there was the, we needed a lot of personnel to also scan these lists. And the students, therefore, had to wait for quite a while for uh, that. Yeah. Uh, sorry, we, we, we just lost you there for a while, I Is think. I think we just lost you. We we're okay. I've got you back again now. I think um, you might want to. You, know, you okay. <clears throat> you might want to disable your video and then just go based on the. Matthew. I'm sorry. I mean, we we lost you there for a while. I think. I think we just okay. lost you. We were okay. I've got you back again now. I think. Um, you, know, you, you might want to disable your video and then just go based on the. Okay. Okay, when when do we drop um, out? We're not really sure when you dropped out, but it's probably okay if you just continue. It sort of became delayed. And then okay, we, I'm yeah. just going to go and continue. I mean, well, okay, one problem was... Um, we're not really sure when you dropped out, but it's probably okay if you just continue. It sort okay. of became delayed. And then so one problem was really data quality that we wanted to improve. We wanted to improve the duration of exam preparation and evaluation. And also we wanted to gain more flexibility because our exams are geographically quite, well, not for Australian standards, but for Swiss standards quite far apart. We needed more flexibility in distributing the exams to the different uh, places where the exams uh, took place. Also, there were safety concerns sending an exam uh, by, by, by postal service and it was not possible to make last minute changes anymore. So that by the motivation why we actually developed the system. We're going to see uh, towards the end of the presentation also how it developed. It developed through several stages of different technology, but I'm going to tell you how it works at the moment, or the, the, the version, the, the current version, how it really works. EOSCI is a free component system. On the one side, uh, to prepare the checklists and, uh, and set up the exam, there's a software called OSCI Editor. It's a software running on OS X for, for Apple computers and it just helps you prepare examinations and in the end also helps you downloading the results um, after the exam. Then the main component that the examiners uh, use on iPads is called OSCE Eval and allows the examiners to assess the candidates using the, the prepared checklists and for administrative personnel there's an application called OSCE Track which runs on iPads or iPhones or similar that allows the administrators to track the progress of the exams. It's a component that we added uh, only after a while uh, when realizing that it's very important to be able to look into the rooms where the examiners um, use the software to, to track if everything is running smoothly or not. So the three components as an overview again, the Eval app uh, running on iPads, preparation app OSCE editor and OSCE track for supervising the exam. So how does that work to set up an exam with EOSCI? Um, we differentiate three phases. 
preparation phase before the exam, an execution phase during the exam, and an evaluation phase at the end when we look at the results. We download and look at the results. The preparation phase um, is mainly done on OSCE Editor. You can either import data like examiners, candidates, or in checklists from several sources, um, or you can type it right into OSCE Editor on your Mac. Um, when you have finished preparing your exam, <coughs> it usually takes like 15 to 20 minutes for a checklist. It takes uh, maybe an hour to set up uh, the whole exam, so it's quite quick. Um, when you're done preparing the, the whole exam, then you publish the checklists to a server. There's several options for servers that you can use. We use an Amazon cloud server because um, availability of these servers is very good. Um, at the end, after you published the, 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 the exam files to the server, you download these files onto the individual iPads with OSCE eval on them. Also, in the preparation phase, you need to prepare your devices. That might sound like a, a not, not such an important task, but actually when having to prepare 50 plus uh, iPads, it's quite a thing to uh, charge them and to prepare and configure all of the iPads. So there is a question coming from Berlin. Um, if we put the candidates' privacy information on Amazon servers, there actually isn't that much private uh, information uh, about the candidates except the names of the candidates. Yeah, names are actually on, on these servers. But the data is being encrypted. We're, I think we're going to hear about that uh, some more later. The data is being encrypted always before it is sent over any kind of connection and before it is stored on the Amazon servers. So even if someone should be getting access to these servers, they wouldn't be able to do anything with the, with the data. And it's always encrypted on the device, not like on Amazon. No, it's not encrypted at Amazon. It's encrypted on our devices. Also, the grading is encrypted on the iPads and not on, on the server. So it's encrypted before it is being sent. Um, yeah, the, the software is, for the moment, is only on iOS devices. It's a native application, natively programmed, so it's only available uh, for iOS devices. We have plans to um, extend at least the editor component also to other OSs, but um, we are not quite um, finished with that yet. Um, um, to continue, also preparation phase is really um, um, all about um, testing, uh, testing, look at the, the, uh, the prepared exam files and look at all the devices, is uh, the, the wireless working at the exam site. Um, EOSCI is luckily, and we're very happy about that, also um, able to do an examination completely offline. <clears throat> you need to have a connection when you prepare the iPads with the exam files, naturally, um, but you can run the complete exam offline. And it, yeah, offline is really <laughs> quite important. Um, it did happen in Bern as well. It happened like pretty much everywhere we heard about it. Uh, uh, there were problems with internet connection, so. It's um, yeah, it's quite good that that it's it's possible to grade offline. There is one drawback 
doing it offline because you don't have uh, backups on the server. Uh, all the exam information is on the iPad, but we didn't have any problems with the iPad so far. So this is also one of the reasons why we still use uh, iOS devices or iPads and not some other devices. That are, it's a very good uh, environment system as well, the software as the hardware. Um, <clears throat> but if a device would fail, that might um, pose a problem. Um, during the, the examination, uh, during the exam, the examiners assess the candidates by, by filling uh, out the checklists. You'll see how that works uh, in a minute. And OSCE EVA backs up the data every minute by sending a copy to of the, all the data to the server. Um, dur also, during the exam, you can monitor the progress of the examination when using OSCE track. And as soon as everyone has finished, the, the examiners sign their exam at the end. You'll also see that in a minute. As soon as you see that every, everyone has finished, you can download the results in OSCE editor and export them to a, the, the older raw data to a CSV format file. It's a very straightforward process, and it's really a button click away to collect all the results. So, but now enough uh, theoretical uh, talk. I think it's time for a little demonstration, and I give the word to Sebastian, which will demonstrate to you how OSCE OS is working. Hello everyone, this is Sebastian and I would like to show you our software components and show you a bit how they, they work on the devices. So let's start with the OSCE editor. As Philip told you, this is the um, software part which is for the personnel that prepares the exam. Um, it basically allows you to prepare all the checklists. Um, you can structure the checklist however you want. As you can see on the left side, we have in this project, we have two checklists. One is uh, fatigue and the other one is a uh, German version of this. It's called Mudikite. And this checklist um, consists of several uh, topics, which is just uh, for, for the grouping of the elements. And each element is, um, is like a task to the examiner, which he has to assess the, the student for. There is, oh, I think this circle got a bit out of place. Um, it's supposed to be uh, around the, um, the station title. What we can see here is the, another part of this application, which is about schedule of the exam. On the left side, you can see um, a column named rotation title. This is basically what we, a rotation is what we call the, the container of um, a group of stations. So, for example, if you have um, a run in the morning and a run in the afternoon, this would be two rotations. And each uh, candidate has to complete all stations which are inside one rotation. So, on the right side, you would see the, all the stations that the candidate has to, to, um, uh, to complete. And in this example, there are only two. And the good thing here is that once you have prepared all the stations, then the sequence for each candidate is calculated automatically. So, for example, um, we set here um, Moritz Mettler to start on the chest pain station. And the system already knows that he will have to go to the fatigue station um, next. So this is calculated all automatically. It's really great. Then I'd like to show you another part of this app, which is the, the results section. Um, the results is basically just um, 
a way to download all the data that is uh, on the server. And once you downloaded all the data, you're able to export um, reports. So you will get um, the completed checklist as PDF for each candidate. And also you will get a kind of a spreadsheet which contains all the raw, raw data of the exam. Um, there are other sections like examiners and candidates which basically serve to um, import or, or uh, create all the names of, of the candidates with their uh, ID. But I'm not going to show you this. If you are interested to, um, in seeing this, you um, please contact us and we will provide you with a, with a copy of, of our software so you can try it yourself. We'll show the, the link to um, to our website at the end of the presentation. So let me continue to the next component, which is OSCE Evo. This is, um, as Philip told you, this is the part of the software that will run on the iPad, and this is what the examiner is going to see when he starts up OSCE Evo. You can see here a staple of checklists. Um, these are the, the dedicated checklists for just one examiner. So if he um, will be at the exam for the whole day, he, he might see two staples, which um, are one for the morning and one of the, for the afternoon session. So since we have only one here, he would click, he would tap on this uh, staple, and he would see just the first checklist for um, the first candidate that should appear on his uh, station, which is Sabrina Deckman. So what you can see basically here is um, the checklist as, as we have prepared it um, in OSCE Editor. And there are several elements which I would like to explain to you. Um, on the right side, there's a column which um, contains just one assess button. So if you want to um, assess an element and you would, for example, would like to say whether the um, candidate has asked about the peculiarity of the patient's, patient's fatigue. Then you tip on the button on the right and choose yes if you did that correctly. And you can also see those bubbles which are already marked here with a green color. These are just like a reminder for the examiner. It's not that he's required to use them, but it's really to, to be able to remind whether the candidate has mentioned the duration and also the development, for example. And there is also um, an instruction which says, well, please, um, if the examiner mentioned these, both of these, uh, of these uh, elements, then you should uh, probably give him a yes for this. Okay. And there's one question coming in. Yes, that's that's correct. We prepare for each station. We prepare one iPad, uh, which will hold all the data that is required for for that station for one day. And we repeat that for um, if the exam is, for example, three days long, then we re repeat that um, for each day. So in this screenshot, you will see the pop-up that appears once you uh, hit that button on the right. Um, this is a really nice solution, which I'm going to explain in a minute. So we, we came up with this solution after uh, a few other versions that we tried. So he would, put, he would uh, tap the black button, and then the pop-up appears, and then he can choose um, whatever he wants to assess the candidate with. So if the examiner slides the whole checklist to the right with his finger, then he's going to see the, the candidate list. And also this list is sorted in the order which uh, the candidate should, should appear on his station. And the coloring that you can see here means, I mean, you can see um, a little bubble which is uh, of orange color and it has uh, the number 11 on it. That means you have 11 elements left to complete the assessment for this uh, specific candidate. 
And the next candidate, which is uh, Moritz Mettler, isn't assessed at all. Therefore, you can uh, see the bubble has a red color and a cross on it, which means you, you will have to do the whole assessment once the, this candidate enters the room. Also, you see um, a sign button at the top. But this time, it is uh, of red color, which means you are not, not uh, you haven't completed the evaluation yet. So once you would have completed, it will turn green. That means you, um, you're free to sign the exam and say, well, I'm finished with it. I don't want to make any more changes. And I will show this in a second. And the question is, can you enter free text comment as well? Uh, yes, you can. I think you cannot see that on this slide. But on this one, there is a, an icon just at the really bottom of the screenshot, which is uh, looks like a paper. And there you can take some notes, some free text notes for each candidate individually. Well. For colorblind examiners, I think um, we have not like a dedicated uh, version for colorblind people, but I think it's just it's um, just made for you, and you can al always uh, rely on the numbers. So if you can see any numbers in this bubble, that means you will have to do some work. And if you see an X, then you will know that you have to completely assess this candidate. And if there um, is a check mark. Then you can be sure that you have finished the uh, finished assessing this candidate. So it's not really you know, don't really relies on the color, but also we have like an icon for each element. So once you are finished, then we can tap on the sign button, which pops up uh, the screen. Um, there you can use your finger to sign the exam. Um, confirm that you're really sure that uh, everything is complete and you don't want to make any more changes. Once you do this, you get back to the overview screen and now your checklist got this uh, lock icon. And now, so you know that this um, rotation is, is completely finished. Um, there's another question whether we have uh, a counter to tell how much time is left. Well, we in a previous version, we had this kind of a timer, but we somehow got to the point where we um, realized that it's really difficult to, to synchronize all the clocks. And um, imagine if the exam starts late, for example, just one minute, then everything is out of sync. So we decided to um, take another approach. I'm just going back to that slide. Um, there is a time icon which you can use to start your your custom timer. For example, we've got some cases which um, ask the examiner to remind the candidate, for example, after four minutes that he should really stop doing the anamnesis if he is still doing this. So you can use this just as a personal aid to um, track the, the time yourself. But it's not like a, a scheduled timer which we have in previous versions. OK. So I think this is the last slide for OSCE eval. Now I'm going to show you the OSCE track component, which is um, for the administration personnel to keep track of the, of the whole exam and see whether everything, everything is going smoothly. So if you've got multiple rotations for one day, you would see multiple entries in this table. But we would just get one. So we uh, would tap on this entry there. And what you see here is the basically all the, the stations will um, back up their whole data every minute. As Philip told you, the um, OSCEVAL is able to run completely offline. But if there is Wi-Fi, then it will try to back up data every minute. And if there is Wi-Fi, you can use OSCE track to monitor when the last exam was, uh, the last backup of the exam was uploaded to the server. And we decided to also use kind of um, 
status for 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 each station, which shows you if, if everything is okay, or if you maybe should uh, be ready to help the examiner because he might have some troubles filling in his checklist. For example, the fatigue station here did the last backup 40 seconds ago, so this is just perfect. But there is the other station with the chest pain case, and this this device didn't make a backup since five minutes. So you might be you might should get ready um, to to go over to the station during the break and see whether the examiner needs some help. On the right side, you see a progress bar which shows you how much of the of this rotation is already completed for this specific station. If you tap on one of these entries, you will see a quick overview of the of the, of the ratings of this checklist. And you can see all these elements of the checklist have like a, an index or a number, which is, uh, for, for this example, it ranges from A1 to F1. Um, those values that you can see here are just the uh, coded values, like, for example, two, two would mean yes, or zero would mean no, and one would mean partially. Um, but you're really free to customize however you want that for your exam. So with this overview, you can get uh, get an overview with, um, to to show you whether the examiner may have problems with his checklist, or also may he may have problem understand fully understanding his case. So if there are any missing items, he may also need some help. Okay. Now I would like to tell you a bit about how we came to to our solution um, because we really started quite a while ago with our first approach. Way back in 2009, they, there were two students that um, they uh, with their bachelor thesis they made the first prototype to tackle this problem of. Uh, turning paper-based checklists into digital ones. Um, it's, it was called Nomea. It was a, an application that ran on the iPhone, and you were basically able to represent the checklist, and you could select the candidates, and you could uh, assess the candidates. And also, you had like, a status whether there are any missing items. And also, it was able to store the exam results on the server. But the problem with this was that the examiner, they didn't feel that confident scrolling um, through the checklist on, their, on this really small device. So we came to a point where we, we saw that um, the screen might, might be a little bit too small for this kind of examination. If you compare this to the, the size of a A4 paper, that it's really just a, a really small part of that. And to, to display a whole checklist on this screen is really difficult. So we did another approach, which was on a tablet. At this time, they, there were several tablets, but um, there was, for example, a Windows version, um, the Android versions already uh, were, in, were uh, starting to appear on the market. But um, in the first place, we tried that on a Windows tablet. Because there is more space, then you're able to display more of the checklist at one time. And also, you were able to take some notes with a pen. And because those tablets have better performance, you could uh, use stronger security concepts. And nevertheless, it's still mobile. It's um, like the iPhone, it's a mobile device. You can carry it wherever you want. And because of this larger screen size, we have better flexibility than on the iPhone. So one first version looked like this. And as you can see, it's um, quite different to what it looks like today. We tried to simplify the interaction that the examiner had with the iPhone, and we tried to make the user interface more attractive. 
To do so, we did first prototypes on paper and then turned them into mockups in Photoshop. Um, we made a prototype which we could use for experiments and for testing with real examiners. So this was really our most important target to not focus on features or, or feature lists that we were given but to really focus on the, the person that is using this device, which will be a doctor or an examiner. So after another iteration, we came to this prototype, which was uh, quite attractive, and you were able to um, take notes with the, with the pen. But then we discovered that, that there are other problems, because if you want to take notes with the pen you cannot really put down the whole, the whole hand on the tablet because if the palm rest is on the tablet, you're not able to write. You really have to hold the, the pen and not touch the device at all. Also, there was a, a remarkable delay during writing, which may confuse the examiner. And also because you cannot put, put down your, your uh, hand, it, the writing was really uncomfortable. So this wasn't really the, the solution we, we hoped we, we could reach. So finally, um, after this prototype, the iPad came to the market. And we were really excited because this device wasn't that, wasn't that heavy. And also, it didn't get uh, that hot, which was really also an uncomfortable property of the Windows tablets. And also, the screen size was really just perfect to display a checklist. And we thought that is, it, they really have a good mix between overview and portability. It's a small device, and but it's, the screen is large enough to display all the information required. Mm -hmm. And also, it has good performance, so no lagging means um, good interaction, and also because they provided a kind of a hierarchical navigation this uh, navigation problem was solved as well. But on the other side, we were not able to use a pen anymore because there is no such thing for the iPad. And it was quite difficult to achieve uh, a reliable and, and uh, strong security for, um, for the examination storage. And the UI was still improvable, which means it wasn't in the final stages yet. So the first prototype looked like this on the iPad. Um, as you can see, it's uh, quite colorful. And what you see here compared to the solution that we now have is that we, uh, in the first place, we tried to put the buttons uh, just next to each other. But we, we realized that this isn't the solution we would be totally happy with. So we really had to come up with a better solution for the assessment buttons. This one is uh, more or less the same version, but with a, a bit more polished. You can see you have at the bottom there is an overview of the, of the candidates that you still have to assess which is a bit similar to we have uh, to the version we have now, but um, we were still able to improve that. So we did uh, a bit more of uh, sketching and mocking and prototyping. And as you can see here on the right side, there is um, it's what we call a, a popover. And this was um, our solution to be able to not display just every button next to each other, but just display one button and then allow to take the uh, assessment of that element. Oh, um, there is one question from you, Matthew. Um, I think you you're asking about this this buttons on the left uh, on the button. Um, it's not that they are wrong, but we notice that it's an information that the examiner does not require during. Uh, during filling in the checklist. So we um, put all this information to the sidebar now. And oh, okay. Um, are you 
Are you talking about the, the buttons on the checklist or the button at the, at the bottom of the screen? Okay. I think I Another question is whether we have tried to um to integrate like audio input. Um we have been thinking about this and is it is really a good option, but there is one downside that is um you cannot do uh, any recording during the exam because the examiner is not allowed to speak when an examiner is in the room, uh, sorry, when a uh, candidate is in the room. That means he would have to um, recall all the things he noticed um, when the candidate was in the room and then do this recording um, during the break. And he may not have enough time to do so. But it's really an important um, thing to think about and we may come up with a solution for this in the future. Yes, um, thank you. Okay. Once we integrated this popover uh, version, then it looked uh, more or less like the version we have now. Then this was uh, the version that we really uh, excessively tested and experimented with real examiners and, and uh, asked them whether there's anything we can still improve. And what we ended with is now this really uh, slick solution that we have now, which provides a really great uh, usability and uh, great interaction for the examiners. And that's the current version that you can now download in the App Store, and you will see the link to this version um, at the end of this presentation. Also, to um, we. We were not just uh, quite happy just having found kind of solution. We really wanted to uh, verify this in academical studies. And you will find on our website, um, you will find some papers that we that we did um, where we ever evaluated um, how much confident the examiner and the candidate are, and um, how much better performs this um, this popover solution compared to the to the button listing. So please feel free to have a look yourself on, your, on our website. Okay, now I want to hand over to Philip again, and he will uh, talk about a bit about the evaluation. Thank you. So you've heard that <clears throat> we made quite a few turns uh, when developing the system. We kept on really testing uh, mock-ups, we kept testing prototypes and actual applications in the laboratory as well as in the field. We, have, we are lucky that we are very close to, to the people that actually run the exams, so we were able to always sort of like parallel um, in an exam the paper with an electronic version. Uh, also, this uh, study that we did uh, to compare the, the popovers to the to the button listings is an example that we really took it seriously to uh, to come up with uh, better solutions for problems that we encountered that uh, examiners encountered when using the application. I mean. I don't want to get into all these evaluation results that we that we have from from um, these about four years that, that the application exists now, but just as an example, <clears throat> evaluation that we did with 25 examiners um, here in Bern, um, where we asked them to fill out a questionnaire, a paper questionnaire, after a two-day OSCE exam with eOSCE, and we asked. Uh, several uh, different uh, uh, areas like subjective impressions, stability of the system, the usability, the information quality, the emotional quality, the mental effort used to run or to use the system, and the preference for electronic or paper version. And it's, um, or we're 
quite happy. I mean, we keep on getting uh, very good feedback from from people and especially examiners using the system. And you see when you look at the results here uh, that these evaluations or this good feedback uh, seems to also reflect in a proper evaluation. I mean, usability rating 6.5 from a 7-point Likert scale, uh, especially uh, mental effort. Okay, I mean the 102 doesn't really mean uh, much, but what was quite uh, astonishing for us <clears throat> was that the writers with EOSCI actually had less or used less mental effort than writers with paper checklists. Yeah, that would be quite nice if the examiners would be uh, 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 less stressed and then make more accurate exams. I mean, that's the the result we um, we took out of this evaluation that the writers apparently have more time or, or more focus to to on on the student than um, looking for the items on on multi-page checklists. So it's definitely a good thing um, that it uses less mental effort. And the preference ratings were also quite clear. 23 writers preferred eOSCI compared to one that preferred paper for I don't know what reason and one was undecided. Uh, just a quick thing for, um, yeah, we did a whole bunch of evaluations with all versions of it. And not just we did evaluations, but um, all over. Um, we're coming towards the end now, and just to say where is EOSCI in use at the moment? It really in regular use, it's on all five uh, universities in Switzerland, also at the um, medical school in Lancaster and in Sydney, and also in Vienna. They just started this year, and we'll stick with it. Overall, we sent out probably 50 or 60 um, test systems for uh, universities to evaluate, but we're, um, um, they don't really use it regularly yet, but just as a in an evaluation state. Where can you get EOSCI? The applications are free, so you can get them in the App Store, uh, iTunes App Store, or Apple App Store, the Track and the Eval parts. And you can just write us a, a quick email if you would like to use the editor as well. Um, we, will, we will be happy to send you a, a version of it. Yeah, so thank you very much for listening. You can find more information about the system and about us uh, on the website on at eoski.ch. Uh, contact us anytime at hello at eoski.ch. Um, yeah, I don't know if you have any more questions or if Matthew is going to take over now. Um, this is what we had to say. Thank you. Okay, thank you. That's really interesting. Um, people who would like to ask questions, please type them into the text chat. Um, or if you would like to ask an audio question, um, please feel free to raise your little hand symbol there and we can um, pass the mic to you as well. If people have questions, please type them in. Okay, here are the questions coming for. Okay, why do we use Amazon servers? Well, there's two reasons for it. One is, well, three reasons. One is the, the technical side. The Amazon servers, they automatically back up every version that is sent to, to this, this kind of server, to the S3 server. So you have a whole history of how the candidates were evaluated. And even if something goes wrong, you still have the whole history. Uh, it has a very uh, good SDK for 
uh, to put into iOS applications to use these servers, then they have a very high availability. I and mean, this is not it's not a single server, it's like a server farm. So the uptime of the service is, is incredibly good. And uh, lastly, it's also incredibly cheap. It really costs uh, like 50 cents or not even 50 cents per month for all the exams that we do. And this is, it's simply not possible to run your own server for that price. Um, I mean, we were also kind of um, yeah, uh, unsure in the beginning if, if it's okay to put, these, uh, to put this data on, on a cloud server. But we ended up just saying, well, it's it's really it's all encrypted. It's a high encryption uh, mechanism, so there is really no danger in in putting this data on a cloud server. And even if the NSA is able to break the the encryption, I'm not really sure what the NSA is going to do with uh, OSCE results. Um, yeah, I have re-evaluated how much less time for a support staff in running the OSCE. Um, not really exactly. Um, depends on what you exactly mean by support staff. It's definitely the way that it's definitely the case that you need way much less time to prepare the exam and to uh, evaluate the results in the end. I mean, you don't need to scan any lists. You don't need to collect the lists or anything. Um, but you need more personnel during the exam because you have to support the examiners uh, for when they, when they have technical problems. So we uh, couldn't really tell you, say you a number or uh, if we really uh, need uh, less staff, definitely for preparation and evaluation. Have we used the system in a normal clinic setting LEP? Sorry, I don't know what LEP is, but maybe you can explain. Um, do you use Amazon Cloud for other university services as well? Um, not really at the moment. We really, it, we Amazon has a whole range of different servers. So you have application servers, you have uh, backup servers, archive servers, and we just use it uh, the, the storage server, the S3. And we're up to now, we're quite happy. I mean, you're free to choose your own SFTP server. But then you need to make sure that it's really redundant, that uh, that it's always up, that um, it's yeah, it's really running during the exams. Um, okay, really, I don't know, Tracy, what LEP is, so it, it's a bit difficult for me to answer that. But we have different um, scenarios for uh, EOSTI, <coughs> and we're also uh, uh, trying to develop new scenarios to use it not just for OSCE exams, but for any kind of oral exam. But I don't know if this is what you asked. Does it work? <laughs> Wearable technology in Google Glass for um, taking um, uh, audio and, and visual input, yeah, definitely, it's possible. Mm -hmm. um, I would like to answer the question of um, how will you get the results from each station onto the server if there is no Wi-Fi in the exa examination room. There are two ways to accomplish this. Um, one way is to just at the end of the exam, you just take the iPads and bring them, take them to a place where there is Wi-Fi, and then OSCE will automatically know that it wasn't able to upload the exam, and then it will try to do that just that moment when it uh, gets internet access. 
Um, the other way is that you just can connect the iPad to your computer and um, just can download the the exam files um, through the wire. So you don't need um, Wi-Fi to do this, but you can. It's easier. But definitely, um, if there is no Wi-Fi, you are able to do it. So yeah, Tracy, longitudinal evaluation. Theoretically, it's possible because you can set up the um, you can set up like the the runs that we had or the the uh, like the, the different points in time you can set up as a as a separate exam and then put the results together. It's not supported in a way that you can uh, directly compare uh, between different points in time for a longitudinal evaluation. But you can do it manually afterwards after downloading all the results from different points in time. We had this request before about longitudinal studies as well, but um, we don't support it at the moment. Okay, um, could you, I have a short, very quick question. Sorry, I keep hearing myself. Um, could you tell the audience how they might uh, implement this system in their institution? Is there a license fee they need to pay or is it going to be available as open source or what, what sort of a mechanism if people are interested in obtaining this? Um, for an ongoing basis? Um, the applications, I mean, the applications in the App Store, they're, they're free. Um, you can just go to the App Store and download them. It's also the, the editor we will distribute to you for free if you want to evaluate the system. And if you really use it at OSCE exams, you are required to um, close a service agreement with us <clears throat> and this is uh, going to be a yearly fee for that service agreement. It includes uh, support, it includes free updates of all applications, it includes um, some consulting hours and this contract is going to cost 10,000 Swiss francs per year. Um, that's also about 10,000 Australian dollars, about 8,000 euros. And um, the idea is that we build a community of eOSCE users and that we try to make it um, cheaper the more um, partners that are in the network. So we, we don't, we are not a interested in, in, in making money with the system, but we're interested in uh, distributing it as, as far as we can. And if there's more people using it, it will become cheaper uh, for the ones that are in the network. Okay, um, another question. Do people have to use Amazon or could they, have, could they set up the servers inside their own institution? Um, yes, they can uh, use a, a known FTP, SFTP server. Um, it's definitely possible to, to use that, but um, as Philip mentioned before, um, you have to make sure that the data is backed up yourself and you have to take care of the server yourself. But you can choose this option um, instead of uh, going for the Amazon service, yes. Um, how many people are using it at the moment? That's a bit uh, 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 difficult to say. I mean, it depends on how many examinations are run. Or, I mean, at the moment there's the, there's eight universities uh, really using it regularly, multiple times uh, a year. Uh, quite big universities, for example, uh, the medical university in Sydney. In Lancaster, also the Medical University in Vienna, they are very big. We also use it for the national final exams in Switzerland. So that's a whole bunch of universities uh, at the same time. Um, there's really 
as I said, there's a, there's really a, a lot of um, parties uh, running tests at the moment and evaluating it. So we really hope that they're going to start using it as well soon. Exactly how many exam examinations are run, we don't know because really the data stays with you or on your, on your server or Amazon server, but not um, with us. So we don't uh, we don't see what exactly you do or how many exams you run. Okay, um, thank you very much. Um, I think we better leave it there. Um, Sebastian, Philippe, thank you. It was very informative. Hopefully that gives people some great ideas and hopefully they'll get in contact with you. Um, so I'm going to stop the recording, but people can stick around if they want. But just the last official thank you to Philip and Sebastian. Thank you, Matthew, for inviting us. And it was really interesting to have you all. You're welcome. Okay, recording stops.